Uh, I want to share for you a message this morning. It's a, I've shared a couple on this particular theme. It's called perception. What is your perception in the midst of pressure and things that happen? And this is actually the third message in this particular area of perception. I know it's scattered and jumped around because I've thrown them in at different points. So if you want to see the rest of it, you'd have to go to our Dunamis app and you'd be able to get those if you need to backfill them or get the area. But this particular message that I have is called Steady Your Nerves. You want to know something? If ever there is a time we need to steady our nerves, it's now. It's now. Theodore Roosevelt, American president, I personally like this fellow. You know when we use the word teddy bears, teddy bears, it was Theod- it's named after Theodore Roosevelt. It actually meant teddy's bears because he was the first person to bring in the protective animal reserve. They called them teddy's bears, the grizzly bears, teddy's bears. That's how we got the word teddy bears. Not that you really need to know that, but you know, it was just one of those things. But he said this, what a man needs is not courage, but nerve control. Cool headedness. This he can only get by practice. In other words, I'm going to paraphrase. Just because you have failed in certain areas isn't a license to give up. And just because you have failed in certain areas doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you're learning. Life is a journey. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is of Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And Jonathan is the son of King Saul. And I like Jonathan so much. There's so much to like about Jonathan. One of the areas is, is that he knew about true friendship and covenant. And even when his father wanted to cause injury and death to David, Jonathan stood by him. And this is something that's so important. It's something we have to even learn in family, that you always honor family, but you've got to understand that family isn't always right. And you've got to stand for what's right, even if it's not popular. In John 14 from verse 1, it says, That same day Saul's son, Jonathan, said to his attendant, who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. When it says that same day, if you read earlier, that same day Saul with 600 men was hiding. The Philistines were just taking the land. And instead of Saul leading his men, In the name of God, he was hiding. And the Bible says, on that same day, in that same moment when his father was hiding out of fear with 600 men, Jonathan has his armor bearer and he says, let's do something. We're all products of our culture and our upbringing. But that's not an excuse for inaction. That's not an excuse for bad behavior. We're all products of our culture and our upbringing, but it is not an excuse for staying where we are. Verse two says, And Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree in Magon, in the outskirts of Gabeah, and the troops with him about 600. Verse four says, And there are sharp columns of rock on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistines. It wasn't like the enemy was in arm's reach. He had to go out of his way to confront them. You know, we're normally in nature sort of people that avoids conflict or we wait for the conflict to find us. But there comes a point when we say enough's enough. Verse six says, and Jonathan said to his attendant, his armor bearer, come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps, say perhaps. Now I love it when I get these words that aren't 100% from God. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, well, we know God can save us, but even if he doesn't. And here's another one of Jonathan. I know that God can give us victory, but even if he doesn't, like that old saying says, I prefer to drown in faith than walk without faith. And Jonathan said to his attendant, perhaps the Lord will help us Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. In other words, if God's gonna move, God's gonna move and you can't stop it. And there's armor bearer, and I love the faith of this armor bearer. And he says, do what is in your heart. You choose, I'm right here with you, whatever you decide. And I love the faith of this armor bearer. 
I love it in as much as I love Jonathan, and it doesn't tell us his name, but it tells us they were one. As the book of Amos says, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? You know, when you're not in agreement, the Bible says the house is broken. When we're not in agreement as a church, we're not in agreement in leadership, we're not in agreement as a family, we're not in agreement in marriage, there is a devastation that happens. In verse 9, it says, And if they say, wait until we reach you, then we will stay where we are and not go up. So it's like a fleece. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up because the Lord has handed them to us. Now, he didn't pick the easiest one. Like when Gideon did his fleece, it was like, okay, I got this fleece of this ram or this sheep, and I'm going to put it on the ground. And in the morning, if the ground is wet and that is dry, I know it's you. So he made it like really difficult. And the next, and when it was like that, he said, okay, 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 one more time. This time I want it to be wet and the ground to be dry. Now this is not how it is with Jonathan. You could see that Jonathan was edging for a fight. So instead of him saying it was like difficult, he made it pretty easy. Like it's pretty well known that if the Philistines saw this young fella, a prince and the other guy, and they tried to bait him, say, come on up, then he said that bait would be the sign of God. He was picking a fight. He was like not leaving many options to not get involved. So some might say, is he not like Gideon? Now Gideon was a coward by nature, a coward by birth. He said, isn't my tribe the weakest tribe of the 12 tribes? And isn't my family the weakest family of the weakest tribe? And probably saying, and aren't I the weakest member of the weakest family of the weakest tribe? But Jonathan's like this. Now, my daddy might be scared, and he may well have affected our soldiers, but I'm going to do this, even if it takes my life. And remember, the very word martyr is our word we get from Greek, which means witness. Saint means set apart. Okay, all the word saint means is set apart. We get our word sanctification from it, it means set apart. But the word witness, when the Bible says you will be my witnesses, that word literally in Greek means you will be my martyrs, which literally means you love not your own lives. Next time you're gonna tell everybody you're a witness, realize you're saying I wanna be a martyr. That might change your testimony. But in this situation, he was going to give his very being. Now, in verse 11, it says this, and they let themselves be seen. Say, let themselves. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. And the Philistine says, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've been hiding because they already knew them as cowards. And the men of the garrison, verse 12, called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come on up and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, follow me. <laughs> he didn't say, go ahead of me. He said, follow me, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. And verse 13 says, and Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet and his armor bearer behind him, which to me gives an image of them just scuttling so fast. That's, that's the image I have. And Jonathan cut them down and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. They were moving. And verse 15 says, and terror spread through the Philistines. Now remember, terror has been in the camp of Israel. Now it's transferred. How was terror transferred? Because somebody said no more. See, it's not the number. We get fixed on numbers. It's not the number. This preacher in the 1800s says, if one person would just deliberately give the orb, give everything to God, there's nothing God can't do. And the young person there gave his heart to the Lord and his name was D.L. Moody until Billy Graham had led more souls to the Lord than anybody else. When someone stands up, when someone says no more, when someone says it's enough, and the Bible says this, the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified as well. And it says, and the earth shook and terror spread from God. How strong did it get when you read on? It says that the Hebrew soldiers and Saul heard and wondered what happened. 
The funny thing is, Saul realised God was at work and he said, who's missing? He, he was so fixated on fear, he didn't even know his son wasn't around. When you get fixated in fear, when you get fixated in anxiety, when you get these terror nights, when you have these moments, you lose consciousness of those you're meant to be looking after. Steady your nerves. I think in the last several months, there's been enough things happening around us that could unnerve you. The drought, the famine, the devastation of that the fires, the tragedies. And now if many is the coronavirus and the circumstances of these things, and that's not counting the personal things that happen. I think of Colin and Margaret with the tragedy of what happened to their son Stephen losing his legs, yet they're here. I think of my brother-in-law, Doug, who, who fell off the ladder several weeks ago, uh, was unconscious, uh, had have head surgery and a number of things were praying for his full recovery. Another pastor who's not a part of this church but is very close, with, close to me, very, very close, and he just got diagnosed this week with perhaps lung cancer. And I could go on and on and on about things or events or circumstances that happen and they're the sort of things that want to unnerve you. They're the sort of things that want to make you unsettled. They're the sort of things that want to shake your faith. It could be unemployment. It could be financial pressures. It could be a broken relationship. It could be a strained relationship. It could be anxiety. It could be sickness or disease. I mean, it's insurmountable the amount of things there are that could affect you. It could be offense. Offense is one of the things. I'm not doubting anyone's faith. But when you start to give in to one of these five things that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 is a hindrance that stopped the children of Israel getting the promised land, then you need to know you can be born again, you can know God, but you may not be reaching the maximum of your potential. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that there are five things that stops us as Christians reaching our maximum potential in God. He says lust. Lustful things, fornication, any sexual sin, idolatry, anything we idolize before God and His call. Murmuring, where we allow ourselves to get caught up with saying things that are condescending or damaging or, or damning or, or murmuring or gossip. Christians are the, some of the worst gossip people I've ever met. And the fifth one was what they called tempting Christ. And that's where we pray contrary to the word of God. Well, I don't see that happening too much. I see it happen all the time. And normally they call it words of knowledge. Or I feel the Lord has said, or I feel the Lord has called, but there's no scripture. That's tempting Christ. That's asking God to do which is contrary to the word. Because if it can't be found in the Word and verified in the Word, that's not God speaking, that's you. But we say God because we don't want to be questioned. Does that mean we're not saved? No, no. I have no doubt of their salvation. I have no doubt of their love for God. But they will not reach their maximum potential. And then when things go wrong, they go, why has God forsaken me? Why is God doing this? Why has God left me? Why has God blocked me? Why is God... Because God was never in it. God is not some sort of ogre who wants to beat you up because you stepped out of line. People don't go to hell because God sent them to hell. People go to hell because they didn't want Jesus. All God does is honor their decision. We want to have the freedom of our decision without the consequences of our decision. And when we get, I don't know, um, thistles instead of apples, we complain to God, but it was the seed that we planted. There's a, a great American general called Ulysses S. Grant. He was a disaster as a president, but he was great as a general. And Ulysses S. Grant once sat for a photo shoot with a famous Civil War photographer called Matthew Brady, if you've ever heard of him. And the studio was dark. So the photographer Brady sent his assistant up to the roof because on the roof was a skylight and it was covered. So he sent him up to the roof and Ulysses S. Grant was sitting directly underneath this skylight. 
There's a photo I have. I don't, Eric is away on holiday right now, so I don't know if they have it in the back to put up. But he's sitting directly underneath this skylight. And so he sent up the assistant to remove the cover. But what happened, the assistant slipped and he shattered the window. And with horror, not only the photographer, but those standing around the general watched as shards of glass two inches long fell from the ceiling like daggers crashing all around Grant. Each one of them lethal could have killed him. And as the last pieces hit the ground, Matthew Brady, the photographer, looked over and saw that Ulysses S. Grant hadn't even moved, not, a, not, not an inch. He was unhurt. And Grant glanced up at the hole in the ceiling, then back at the camera as though nothing had happened. Like, well, let's get this thing done. There was another situation, and it was called the Overland Campaign, or some others have called it the Wilderness Campaign. Some call it Grant's Overland Campaign. But it happened right basically between May and June of 1864 in the American Civil War. And it was where Ulysses S. Grant was doing battle with the Southern General, Robert E. Lee. And it was during this particular time that Ulysses S. Grant was surveying the scene through his binoculars, his field glasses. And just beside him, a cannon shell exploded. It killed the horse next to him immediately. Everybody was diving for cover. The ground was shaking. And yet when they looked up, Ulysses S. Grant hadn't moved. He was still had the field glasses attached to his head, looking out on the battlefield, working out the best way to deal with the enemy. There was another time, it talks about how uh, uh, Grant was at a place called City Point, not a church, but a place. And it was a Union headquarters near Richmond. And troops were unloading a steamboat, and suddenly the steamboat with explosives exploded. And everybody hit the dirt except Grant, who was seen running towards the scene of the explosion and debris to try and help and save people. They said Ulysses S. Grant was a man who knew how to steady himself properly. A man who knew he had a job to do and would bear anything to get it done, whether it was to sit still for a photo, whether it be in the battlefield to know how to do with the enemy, or whether it be to dive in and rescue people. I mean, there are so many things that unsettle us. I I think of uh, domestic violence and the atrocity of what that man did to his wife and three children. Words can't begin to speak of the illness I feel at the very thought of what happened. And it's not just that. They tell us at least one woman, I believe, a week, a week is killed through domestic violence. There is something wrong with our society. Something wrong, seriously. That's why I run the group called G-Men or Godly Men because we want to tell men how to be godly. And yet I can't tell you that every man who's gone through it has come out godly because there have been many men who've gone through it who completely ignored what we've taught them and done atrocities. In our lives, we get piled with raw nerves. There are competitors who surround our business. There are unexpected problems that suddenly rear their heads. Our best worker, employer, suddenly quits. The computer system can't handle the load we're putting on it. We find ourselves out of our comfort zone. The boss is making us do too much work and everything is falling and crashing down around us. And we feel like we can't handle anymore. Do we stare it down? Do we ignore it? Do we blink once or twice and redouble our concentration? Do we get shaken up? Or do we just medicate? That's the thing today, just medicate. Medicate those bad feelings away. Medicate. And that's just the stuff that happens unintentionally. But there are always people, remember, who are out there who just want to hurt you. They want to intimidate you or they want to rattle you. They pressure you into making a decision before you've gotten all the facts. They want you thinking and acting on their terms, not on yours. So the question is, what do you do? 
Are you going to allow that to happen? How do we handle it? Remember this. Just because we're saved, it doesn't mean we won't be attacked. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we won't do battle with illness. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we won't face financial struggles. That's a wrong doctrine that we've been taught. There is a blessing and we come against these cursed things. But just because we do what's right doesn't mean unrighteous things won't happen to righteous people. But what we do is we learn to put our faith in him because what we have, what others don't have in the same place is we have Jesus. When we aim high, pressure and stress obligingly come along for the ride. If you want to advance, then you've got to realize there will be duress and stress. That's why many people are mediocre. Don't rock the boat. When you decide that you want to step out of the boat, then you will be criticized. You will be critiqued. Things happen. Things that catch us off guard. Things that threatens us or scares us. Surprises, unpleasant ones are guaranteed. And the risk of feeling overwhelmed is constantly there. See, we think that talent is the most important thing we want in characteristics of people. But I'm telling you, grace, poise are two attributes because they precede the opportunity to deploy any other skill. It's the grace in situation. It's your poise in situation. The French historian I'm not a big fan of him personally, but the French historian and enlightenment, which is science over faith, Voltaire. And he made this comment about an English general who was called the first Duke of Marlborough. Let me read the comment. He says of this English general, tranquil courage in the midst of tumult, turmoil, that's what it means. And serenity of soul, emotions in danger, which he says the English call a cool head. And otherwise, this French philosopher was speaking about this English general saying, under pressure, he has a cool head. Now, this first Duke of Marlborough was 1650 to 1722, and his name is John Churchill, which is like the great grandfather of Winston Churchill. And he's probably regarded in British military history as one of the most greatest commanders, believe it or not, in the history. You see, in the 1700s, there was this battle that happened between France and England over Spain. The Spanish king died, and he had no heir. So the French decided they'd move in and take territory. But the English said, no, you won't, we'll block you. And so what was the Spanish situation and the French coming, then the English stepped in. So when I read about how Voltaire describes the Duke of Marlborough, I find it intriguing because he's French and they're at war with the French. But what he's trying to say is the English had a cool head in the midst of battle. Regardless of how much actual danger we're in, stress puts us at a fearful place to where we react instinctively rather than logically. Now, I don't want you to think that because I mentioned grace and poise and serenity, perhaps, that somehow you think, well, you know, that's just kind of like the English aristocrats or whatever else. But I want to tell you what nerve is. Nerve is a matter of defiance and control. Having nerve doesn't mean you don't have fear because any great soldier will tell you that they knew fear, but they overcame it or they ignored it in the battle. So I'm not saying you won't have fear. I'm not saying you won't have emotions because that's a part of life and that's how we know we have courage. But to me, if you don't like the word grace or poise or serenity, and I'd say that nerve is a matter of defiance and control. I will defy my physical sickness or illness or reaction to this intimidating thing, and I will control my reactions. 
In other words, I refuse to acknowledge this situation. I don't agree to be intimidated by this experience. I resist the temptation to say this is a failure. That's what Colin did in the midst of the tragedy when he got the news his son was in a car accident and lost both legs. That's what his son is doing himself, where he has made a statement, I will run again, I'll have prosthetic legs, I'm going to do this. He say, I am defiant. Most people give up their faith if they have a hangnail. This guy's lost both legs. Someone said to me this week, how was Colin when he got the news in church? Well, how was he? Was he battling in his faith? And I said, his faith was a whole new level that inspired me and the church. It inspired us because he says, God is God. God is not the author of this accident. It's not God's plan for this area here. But in the midst of it, God will turn what was meant for bad into good. This is not what Joseph said. What you meant for evil, God turns to good. What is good to save people? You might right now have a situation, a circumstance you've come out of or gone through and you're saying, well, do I have a chance or have an opportunity? Of course you do. Now, people may not always be forgiving, but God's grace is God's grace, not man's grace. And you might have a limp, but I tell you what, it's better to have two prosthetic legs knowing God than to be complete and not knowing God. But having nerve is also a matter of what I call acceptance. It's about us as individuals. It's about us saying, I don't have the luxury of being shook up about this or replaying those words of things in my head. I'm too busy and too many people are counting on me. It's great being a pastor where people can call me up and say, Pastor, uh, can you give me a scripture? Pastor, can you help me? Pastor, can you pray here? Pastor, that's, that's wonderful. But I don't have that luxury. You know, I have people around me, and they're good, but I had, I had the luxury because I realized I've got to make it work. We all want the church to do bigger and better things until I ask you to open up your wallet. We all want the church to move in the Spirit, but we can't come out to pray for half an hour. We all want the church to excel, but I'm too busy to serve. We're saved. We're born again. But it's the remnant I want to tap into. The remnant is the group within the group that says, here I am. But I'm a business person. I don't have time to serve. Great. The Bible says business people can give. Give more. Well, I don't have the ability to give. That's okay. Serve more. See, whatever it is you can do. Well, I'm unemployed. Why aren't you volunteering here at least a day or two days a week? Well, I'm busy. You tell that to Jesus if he calls you home tomorrow. You tell that to Jesus. Great John Wesley was asked, if you knew God was coming back tomorrow... What would you do differently? He says, I live every day like he's coming back tomorrow. Every day. There's always a counter move. There's always an escape or a way through. There is no reason to get worked up. We've got to learn to handle the emotion. We've got to learn to handle it because we destroy relationships. We destroy friends. We destroy family. We destroy marriages. We destroy opportunities. We destroy ministry. We destroy things. Well, what if I've blown it? Say sorry, get back in again and move forward. The Bible never said it would be easy. And of course, the stakes are high. But there is a path. It might be narrow, but it is a path that's there for all of us. The path is narrow, but the path is there. How do I know? Because we serve the king of kings. You know what a king does? A king sits back and lets you go. But the king of kings goes before us and lays a path. He went before us and died and rose again. He went before us. You read that passage in John 20. Sandra and I are going up this morning. You read that passage. They were fearful. Jesus rose from the grave, resurrected. And where were they? They were in the house with the door locked, the Bible says. 
They were terrified. Terrified of what? Of the unknown. And Jesus said, I've come to give you peace. So he breathed the Spirit onto them. He breathed on them. I tell you what, I want the breath of God. I know Shekinah, uh, their conference coming up is called, I don't exactly have got it right here, but breath of God. You can take Hebrew words or you can take Greek. But right now I like Jesus' interpretation, which we see through the Greek, which is I want him to breathe on me. Uh, this morning at 3.30, I did a 6K walk, whatever, walk this time, I didn't run because of what happened last week, but uh, uh, with the dog. And uh, I was out there in the midst of it. And I tell you what, as I go, there's nothing there but me, the dog, a bit of rain, uh, numerous kangaroos and too many and lots of other critters and others I don't know because I can just hear them. But the fact of the matter is this, God was with me. And in that time, I talked to God. I talked to him about you. I talked to him about me. I talked to him about us. You see, If you didn't get born again in the 70s, we're a bit different. Some of you are saying I wasn't even born. I understand. To those of us who got born again in the 70s, we experienced something that hasn't happened since. The charismatic outpouring. And we experienced the Holy Spirit like I, you read in books. We saw things that today people are skeptical about. We saw legs grow. We saw demons come out. We saw blind people see. Problem today is we want to manufacture it. But those days it just happened. I mean, we count our blessings to get you Sunday morning, trying to get you Sunday night. Oh my goodness. But Sunday night was the biggest service in those days in any church, not one, any church. You, you, you didn't get in here 10, 15 minutes before, you couldn't get a seat. That's what was in the 70s. I don't mean here. Cause it's I mean, it was wild. You didn't follow up new converts. They just got saved. They didn't get saved. You couldn't stop them. It was all about prayer. You'd pray and pray. Today, it's all about leadership. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying how it's changed. It's all about leadership. Churches don't like praying too much now. The most successful church is all about leadership. The teaching is leadership. The strategies are leadership. Everything's leadership. Because somehow we just have to do it rather than you catching it. I'm not saying you don't adapt. God forgive me. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you how different it is. I don't need an angle to be in church. I got saved in the 70s. And once you tasted that Holy Spirit, it does something to you. I got saved one week after my mother. I got saved pretty close the same time as Colin. Or at least we all got baptized together in the same water. Sandra got saved at the same time. Didn't know her from a bar of soap. Later on, I'd get to know her. Praise God. We got dunked in something. And it's affected me. Now, there are some who got saved then aren't walking with God anymore. Why? Well, because there was always some weird teaching in those days. And the weird teaching was uh, you just name it and claim it. You know what I mean? And uh, you could be sick, but you'd never confess it because you'd speak death over your life. And if you tithed, then you'd be blessed. And, and there are times of great blessing, but they didn't know how to handle when the wave went back out and you had beach. When a wave comes, you learn how to do a good foundation. If the foundation is not strong, when the wave goes, you're going to go to sand again. And you remember what happens when you build on shifting sand? It's like the little pig who build it with what? Sticks or straw. Huff and puff and they blow it down. Friends, we're living in a time where people get terrified. Anything happens in the Middle East, they think it's the end of the world. A virus comes out, we think it's the angel of death come to get us. Now, these things are very real. I'm not saying they're not. We have fires. We have floods. We say the world's about to explode or implode. Yet, would you believe that the Netherlands yesterday 
had the coldest winter's day ever recorded and it's not anything to do on the news. Nothing. Do I believe in a good climate? You better believe it. I tell you, breathing today is a lot better than it was when I was a kid. Huh? My goodness, try and fly in 1981. The back rows had smoking people in it. Man, you would die anyhow. You, we used to be choked up in 1981. You died. Restaurants were half smoking, half not smoking, and you always get this. I remember in Michigan, um, I always thought Michigan was a bit slow. Wasn't it, Susie? We'd go over there and they'd go, which half? Non-smoking, but that smoke will waffle over. You know what I mean? You don't know how blessed it is today. It's blessed. I mean, we need to always be good, but I mean, it's blessed. I'm telling you. I just don't worship the earth. I meet more in witchcraft today than I ever had before. I was at a restaurant uh, at the, well, once at the place, then the Gold Coast, someone took us down there. And I noticed the lady serving me had a pentagram with a stone in it. Pentagram, five points, which is a satanic sign. So I asked her, so obviously you're religious, what are you? She said, I'm a wicca, which is a white witch. And I saw another one, another one, which is worshiping the earth, okay, yeah. I don't believe in worshiping the earth. I believe in managing it. That's what God told us to do in the garden, but not worship it. So we're living in weird times. But if your feet aren't on the rock, if your feet aren't built upon the foundation, then you get shook up and you begin to fall apart. But when your feet are on the rock, whether it be illness or disease or whatever else comes there, whether it be famine, whether it be tough and times, you stand strong. As we're saying in our mentoring group, Paul says, I've learned to be, what did we say, Brendan? Content, whether with much or with little. See, we don't know how to be content. Contentment doesn't mean I want to stay there. God forbid, no. I don't want you to be content with illness. I don't want you to be content with poverty. I don't want you to be content with a broken heart. Of course, I don't want you to be content. But by contentment, I mean this. I'm able to handle it. I'm able to handle it. I'm able to handle it. The problem today in church is we're raising up too many princesses instead of raising up princes. We're more in tune to our feelings and pretty colors. Oh, I know. I sound a bit out of date to some of your culture. But my culture is standing. Let's see how that other culture stands in 50 years. I'm not saying everything is perfect. I don't want men to be macho. Machoism is not of God. I certainly don't want them to be metro. Metro is not of God. I want them to be Christ-like. The word man is God's word, not this world's. You can use the word male, but man is God's word. The Bible says that I made man in my image. In other words, men in Christ's likeness is synonymous. It's the same. When someone doesn't want God or an atheist says, I'm a man, I said, excuse me, use one of your own words. Ape will do. Don't use God's word. You're an atheist. Use one of your words. Ape. You're a progressed ape. Man is his likeness. Can musicians come up? I've got to stop talking. It's always my weakness. When we can hold our nerve... There's a victory. I was watching. I had time to kill. I was, I was up at two in the morning the other day. I, I did all my things and, and uh, I had, I get up weird times. So I won't lie to you. That's why don't call me at nine o'clock at night. It doesn't work too well. <laughs> you won't offend me. I just don't answer the phone, but I will answer you at three. <laughs> I've done that to a few people. <laughs> Do you realize what time it is? I don't know. Did you realize what time it was last night? Okay, so I'll answer you. You call me, I'll call you back at three. If you text me, I'll text you back at three. So I'll promise you I'll respond. You know what I mean? So I uh, just don't want you to think I neglected you. You know what I'm trying to say? 
an hour. Except Friday night. Friday night's always a late night. Anyhow, I was watching this movie and I never saw it. It was on one of those programs where you rent a movie. I don't know what it was. It was called Midway. Not the other Midway, which is Kirk Douglas. Like, this is a new Battle of Midway. So the actors were nobodies, you know what I mean? But it was still, well, there's somebody to the Lord. But you know what I'm trying to say. Just And I was watching the movie. And I'm not telling you to watch the movie. But I, I was watching the movie. And you realize how there was different people for different times. You know what I mean? Like Churchill thrived in the war. He was useless as a prime minister when there was no war. You know, like Ulysses S. Grant was phenomenal as a general, but he wasn't too good as a president. And he lost all of his money for stupid investments. You take this. So they had, in the beginning of it, on this aircraft carrier, they have this character. I don't know how... Well, there's a after a real person, but I don't know how much is exaggerated. And, and so he's coming in to land on the American aircraft carrier before Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And... Um, as he's about to land, he tells the guy, the gunner sitting behind him. So he says, we know something's going to happen. We need to prepare. And so the gunner at the back goes, well, what does that mean? He says, well, um, it means this. You turn the engine off. He goes, are you kidding? He said, you've turned the engine off and we have to land on the aircraft carrier? He goes, well, in battle, this could be a real reality. We ran out of fuel, the plane shut up. So we've got to do it. But I put the wheels down. So in this movie, they have the little plane coming in. You've got the aircraft carrier because you know the wives. And it disappears. I mean, you know it hasn't, but it's good for the movie. And all of a sudden, with the air gas, it flushes up, lands on the um, deck. And of course, he gets, he gets called up to the commander. He's in big trouble. So he makes up a story like, oh, I had electrical short out, you know what I mean? Which he didn't, you know what I mean? And his, his guy at the back doesn't want to fly from him anymore, you know what I mean? And his wife's upset because he's been the naval all these years and they've been promoted. Then all of a sudden the war comes and Pearl Harbor is bombed and they get in the area. So he's now promoted, 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 promoted for a couple of reasons. One, other guys have died. The other reason is he has nerve. He has nerve. I believe that God calls us for moments. I don't believe when people say, I'm born in the wrong time. I should have been this person at this time or this person. I don't believe in that because I don't believe in reincarnation or any of that stuff. I don't believe in that. I believe I'm born for such a time as this. As Esther said, Hadasha. Hadasha is better. That's a Hebrew name. Esther is a Persian name. Hadasha is her real name. As Hadasha said, Well, Mordecai said to her first, perhaps you're born for such a time as this. And she said, if I perish, then I perish. There's this idea that where I'm at is where I'm meant to be. I just need courage. And by courage is poise, nerve, steady hand. Poise. Please, I, I'm not trying to make you think that I'm insensitive because I know I get labeled as insensitive. And I probably deserve that label sometimes but I'm not trying to want you to think I'm insensitive to your need your financial area or your broken relationship or an illness or, or whatever I don't want you to think I'm insensitive but I want you to understand that I'm kind of like the drill sergeant that says suck it up and it's not meant to mean that I want you to hurt it's not that I want you to cry and it's not that I don't want you to be hugged and there's times to hug, but there are other times where it's saying like this, you're in war. Well, you just got to be kind. Well, let me give an example. Imagine, imagine I'm looking after Zion. Zion's got a sensitive heart, okay? Imagine I'm looking after Zion. Not as much as the other grandparents, but just, and that's just the way I go. But just, that's nothing for your father. Then it's like, all right, so your turn. You know what I mean? But the fact is, imagine he's walked out to the road. Do you think I'm going to say, excuse me, Zion, Zion, don't want to hurt you, baby. Come back to Poppy. Oh, I couldn't care less about his feelings. All I know, there's a vehicle out there. I'm going to go, Zion. What will that do to him? He'll probably put the fear of God in him. He'll probably cry. 
you're probably full of the ground. But he won't go on the road. And I get to hug him and give him back to his dad. See, that's sometimes what the Word of God is like. Sometimes you feel the Word of God yelling at you. Sometimes you feel like the preacher who in some, to some of you is a reflection, is yelling at you. He's not yelling at you saying, I don't love you. He's not yelling at you saying, I don't care about you. He's not yelling at you by saying to you, uh, uh, I'm not insensitive to you. He's not doing that. He's doing to say, look, listen, the way you're going, you're going to face death. The way you're going, you're going to face death. You're going to face more pain. You're going to face a worse calamity. I know you're born again. I know you're saved, but listen to me. That's all you are, saved. You're just saved. Well, isn't that what it's all about? No, it's about being a disciple. It's about being a disciple. It's about making disciples. Why do we celebrate how many people get saved and we don't celebrate how many are discipled? Because getting someone saved is a lot easier than discipling someone. Why do people want to be apostles or prophets or teachers or evangelists? They don't want to be pastors because it's the pastors who disciple. I want you to learn to steady your nerves. It doesn't mean you won't have some bad days and it doesn't mean you won't have some bad moments and it doesn't mean you won't feel anxiety and you want to know what? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to have that meltdown. It's okay. It's just not okay staying there. It's okay to fall down. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to want to hug. It's okay to want to be held. It's okay to want to be heard. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's just not okay to stay there. Because it'll kill you. And we're seeing too many get killed. Father, bless the word to our hearts. Let us have an open spirit to receive. Let us have an open and willing heart to take in. This is not a condescending message. It's not a demeaning message. It's not to pull us down. Jonathan never ridiculed his dad. Jonathan never chastised or gossiped his dad. Jonathan never did that. Jonathan just saw the need and got it done. And then by him doing it, his father caught on and joined in. We don't have to be better by pulling someone else down. We don't have to be better by, by humiliating somebody else. We don't have to be better by saying they're just not cutting the chase. Jonathan never, ever, 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 ever ridiculed his dad. And Jonathan never, ever, ever critiqued his dad. But Jonathan took with what he had and he did something. God, let us do something for the kingdom. If you can't serve in a house, then give in a house. If you can't give, then serve. If you don't have work, then give of your time. Praise God for the brother who came. We needed help because Shane's away and was away and another brother's not well, who came and served on Friday just to help us out in the yard. Yard that you might take for granted, like you went and parked and you don't take for granted. Someone's been out there sweating in that heat and trimmed and did things. Take it for granted. We take for granted that someone gave time and got up early to drive a bus. We could run two buses. We don't have enough drivers. There's people aren't in church today because we can't pick them up. I don't run buses at night because I don't have drivers. I have people want to come. I can't do it. I'm just telling you, church, church, let's pull together. Let's pull together. Don't grow weary in doing good because you'll reap a harvest. If you say to me, Pastor, I want God's blessing on my life. Just jump to your feet right now. Whatever it is, just say, I want God's blessing. Physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, whatever it is, you want God's blessing. I'm with you, Susie. Always. I agree with you. I like you in the front. It's good. I like it. I mean, I wouldn't like it if we didn't agree, but we, are, we can walk together. Look at Amos. Father, I'm standing up with Susie. 
I'm setting up with everybody because it's not just they want to, I want to be blessed. I want a blessing. I want my mind blessed most of all, that I would have the right thoughts because there are moments where I give in to wrong thoughts about people and things. And I need to be constructive and positive. I, Lord, I, I want to be blessed in my mouth because I want to speak life out of my mouth. I don't want to speak negativity or gossip. I want to speak life. I want my heart to be blessed, Almighty God, because I want the desires of my heart to be godly, not to be of this world. I want my eyes to be blessed because I don't want to look upon things uh, in lust or desire, Lord, in those areas. I want my eyes to see the glory of God. As Job 30 verse 1 says, I made a vow, a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon any young thing or young woman. I want my feet to be blessed so that where I walk, I'd bring peace and where I walk, I'd have peace. I want to wear, Lord, a belt of truth that surrounds me and not a truth to where I'm just blunt because I'm blunt, but a truth that loves. And love is benefit of another at the expense of self that before I speak truth, make sure that love is evident. I want faith. I want to be blessed in faith. I want a shield of faith, Lord, because with the shield of faith, I can resist every fiery dart of the enemy. And I want to be blessed in the Word. I want to be obedient in the Word. I want to be hungry for the Word because I want to be able to know how to handle things. And it's the Word of God, Lord, that enables me to do that. According to your Word in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is like a sword that's quick and powerful and sharp. Father, I stand with friends. I don't stand above them. I don't stand below them. I stand beside them. I stand as friends. And I speak to myself, and as much as I speak to them, bless us, bless us. Bless us in our homes. Bless us in our relationships. Bless us in our work. Bless us in our finances. Bless us in health. Bless us with family. Bless us in our mind. Bless us in our emotions. Bless us spiritually. Bless us. Bless us. Undeserved, unmerited. Bless us. Bless us. Bless us. us. 